A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they shall see, and that which they have not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has delivered what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty, that we should look at him, nothing his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as from one who others hid their faces, he was despised. We held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried out our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, He shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous and shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made the intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the book of Hebrews. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the commandment that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is for forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering of sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is this habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. 
Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. 
but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. <clears throat> now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then they handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but write, This man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, 
and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scriptures, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, The Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled, None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of Scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Throughout this Holy Week, beginning on Palm Sunday, I've been framing our Holy Week experience as the opportunity for us as a congregation to take a pilgrimage, a holy pilgrimage. Uh, And the heart of a pilgrim, as I've said now a number of times, is the heart of uh, someone yearning to to know and encounter our Lord, to to know and encounter in a fresh and life-giving way God's presence. Uh, A pilgrim has a humble and a rended, an open heart. Uh, And with that open heart and with that yearning spirit, 
uh, we seek to enter into and experience uh, God's love and grace in new ways. Uh, a pilgrim literally gets outside themselves, gets outside the familiar routines and rhythms of life in order that God can get inside us and do God's holy work of transformation. And with that as my reminder to you, fellow pilgrims, uh, today our pilgrimage takes us uh, to this stark and holy place, the cross of Christ, the place where Jesus gives up his life for the life of the world. I've taken a number of pilgrimages to the Holy Land, and the culmination of almost every pilgrimage is when we walk the way of the cross, the Via Della Rosa, as it's called in Latin, the way of sorrows. Uh, and we take that walk in the old city of Jerusalem, and we stop literally at some of the very places uh, that Jesus walked. Uh, when you take it in the daytime, uh, it, it's, it's, it's an odd experience because uh, you, you take your pilgrimage amidst the josh, jostling shoppers, the people going home or to work or uh, from market or from market, and sometimes they get irritated with you because the pilgrims are sort of blocking the path a little bit, and so you get a little bit of this rude uh, jostling back. Others um, recognize that uh, pilgrims are in a kind of holy space, and there's a kind of awe about it, uh, a kind of reverence. Uh, you are part of some kind of holy tradition, and um, you'll see some of them actually crossing themselves uh, as they pass you by. One pilgrimage I took uh, on, on the way of the cross, the Via Del Rosa, we took very, very early in the morning in order to try to beat the crowds, as it were. And I'll never remember, I'll never forget this one, uh, because um, we, we got to one of the stations in the old city, and you have to remember the old city streets are narrow and winding, and an early morning garbage truck came by. And um, I smelled the stinking garbage. And um, that aroma, and it's not a pleasant one, um, always comes back to me uh, when I think about today's pilgrimage. And, and the stench is the stench of all um, that is just not right about this moment. You know, the jeering of the crowd. You know, if you were the Messiah, you know, save yourself and us, come down from the cross. Um, the cruelty and sadism of the soldiers you know, who, who mock and flog Jesus. You know, the envy and arrogance of some of the religious leaders um, who feel a threat and just want to get rid of this man and silence the threat. the dark underbelly of evil is exposed in this story. And it's not a pretty one. And like the garbage, it stinks. But as we continued on that way of the cross, that way of sorrows, I remember we came to another place, and it was near a bakery, and there was another aroma. It was that delicious, warm aroma of freshly baked bread. And I remember breathing that aroma in. And suddenly I was connected with the one who said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not be hungry. He who drinks of me shall never thirst. 
Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Lehem means bread, the place of bread. And so the second aroma I always sense on this Good Friday is that good smell of the bread of life. And so here we are amidst the muck and the beauty of the human experience. And at the center of it is the cross of Christ. Jesus said to his followers, as you all know, those who want to be my disciples must take up their cross and follow me. And he added, those who would seek to gain their lives must lose them. Let's reflect for a moment about that sense of losing, of loss. As we reflect on the story of Jesus in these last hours, there's a lot of loss. Jesus begins in the Garden of Gethsemane losing his followers as they all scatter when the soldiers come to arrest him. He's then taken and put on trial. He loses the trial. He's then prepared uh, for execution. And because of the cruelty and sadism of the soldiers, he loses his clothes, stripped of his garments. He carries the cross to the place of his execution. He falls not once, twice, three times. He loses his strength. And then on the cross itself, the ultimate loss, he loses his life. To take up our cross as we do today on this pilgrimage and follow Jesus is about our sense of losing as well. Those who would save their life must lose it, Jesus says. And it seems to me what we all lose on this pilgrimage is all the parts and dimensions of our life that are not of God. This is the day to surrender that. This is the day where we empty ourselves of all the attachments, all the convictions, all the emotions, all the actions, all in our life that does not reflect the light and love of God in Christ. It's not easy to let that go. Uh, and it seems to me that's part of uh, the, the challenge and the joy of this three-hour pilgrimage. It's about, yes, Lord, I can let that go. Yes, Lord, I want to lose that. And in this emptying, this losing, this surrendering, to use another word, this letting our defenses down. And we all have those defenses. Life is hard and we can build up a lot of shells around our minds and our hearts and our lives. Today we let them go in order to receive what God yearns to give us, the love and forgiveness, the grace and new life of Christ. The gift of salvation 
is the gift of life, true life, abundant life, eternal life. It's God's gift given freely, fully, without abandon to the world and to us. Are we ready to receive it? Are we ready to let go and lose all that is not of God in order to be made new by the love and grace of Christ? Paul says in dramatic words, my old self is nailed to the cross. You know, that was his way of expressing vividly that sense of it's time to let it go. He says, my old self is nailed to the cross. And he writes also that I, I want to receive and know the power of his resurrection. I want to receive and know the power of his love in order that I might live as Jesus calls me and the world to live. This way of servant, self-giving love that is the way of God, the way of Jesus. And I know I can't do it on my own power. I can only do it through the grace and power and love of Christ. So this pilgrimage is about letting all of that in and letting go all that would keep us from receiving that. And so I pray as we take this walk over this next two and a half hours now, I pray that you will sense the aroma of Christ the aroma of bread baking, the aroma of life given to you and to the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand for the solemn colics. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Peter, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, that God will confirm his church and faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for Joseph, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord.
Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer. Let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which have grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you now to kneel as able for the anthems of Good Friday.
We glory in your cross, O Lord. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. O Savior of the world, who by thy cross and precious blood has redeemed us,
Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead. To your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we conclude this uh, first hour um, during the singing of the anthem that is about to be offered, uh, people are invited, if they so wish, to come up and kneel at the foot of the cross. There's a tradition of Christians of, called venerating the cross, kneeling, perhaps touching the cross. Some people even kiss the cross. Uh, or you can remain in your seats uh, and then following the anthem, uh, we will begin uh, the second hour in the Stations of the Cross. Uh, the offering today, and there's an alms basin placed at the back of the church, is to support the ministry of the work of the church in Jerusalem, and we'll be supporting St. George's College, which is a place of pilgrimage for Christians uh, throughout the world to come to Jerusalem. <laughs>
I invite us now to begin the second hour of our three hours by standing and singing the first four stanzas of hymn 458. My song is love unknown.
as we now prepare to walk the way of the cross, starting on this second hour, uh, you're invited to have your liturgy for the Stations of the Cross uh, with you. In a moment, I'm going to invite everyone to just come on out of the pews and we'll gather at our first Station of the Cross right here. Years past has taught me that we all can't quite gather around the station, so we'll spill out into the aisles and around, and that's okay. Uh, and uh, the way we'll mark the stations of the cross, that after every second station, you'll be invited to be seated wherever you are, so just find a spot. And then we'll be offering uh, reflections about what I call the characters of the cross the people who are around Jesus in these last hours, to hear something of uh, their reflections through the voices of members uh, of St. Gregory's. Uh, so um, one last thing that you're invited to share in carrying the cross. Uh, Walter, our today's crucifer, has the, the cross right now, but after the first station, um, people can just take turns uh, and have an opportunity to get, carry the cross to each of the stations. Uh, we don't have that organized. We just let your spirit move. If you want to carry the cross, just come up and uh, you'll be, I'm sure, given an opportunity uh, to do that. So with that as an introduction, I now invite us to come on out and literally enter into this pilgrimage and gather at our first station here at the front of the church. Please join me. you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. to the cross willingly. When we feel imprisoned, help us to recall your unfailing mercy for release and healing. We lift up all who are enslaved. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Okay. The second station, Jesus carries his cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, 
because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Jesus went out bearing his own cross to the place to the, the place they called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Like a lamb, he was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is mute, so he opened not his mouth. Worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. Sometimes we may suffer silence. We may feel that our sorrows and burdens are too much to speak aloud. We may wonder if our cross, whether taken up willingly or laid upon us, will be the death of us. Despair may be very close. In the midst of it all, we are called to trust that through our sufferings, Christ will teach us patience and obedience, breaking our hearts wide open so that his healing light can flood into every corner of our being, lighting up our load. Let us pray. Jesus, help us to remember that you are always speaking words of hope into our silent suffering. We lift up all who want to speak, but are afraid or do not have the words. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one, have mercy upon us. I now invite you to find a place to be seated uh, as we have the first of our reflections on the character of Peter. Good afternoon. My name is Peter. I was a fisherman from Galilee. I want to tell you about my best friend. I first met him after fishing all night. He was talking to the crowd and needed to borrow my boat. After he finished, he told me to take my boat into deep waters and put down my net. I was skeptical. I told him we had worked hard all night and hadn't caught anything, but I did what I was told. Immediately, the net was filled with fish so much that the other fishermen had to help bring in the catch. And there were so many fish, the boat almost sank. I had never seen such a catch. I knew at that moment I was in the presence of someone greater than myself and immediately said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. He responded with the words I would hear many times from him, do not be afraid. And from now on, you will catch men. He also called me Peter. So I left my life as a fisherman with my brother Andrew to follow him. James and John joined as well. It was the greatest decision of my life. I have many stories I could share with you, but I will share some of my favorites. I'm unsure why Jesus picked me, as the other disciples were more submissive to Jesus' words. I always seemed to say the wrong thing at the wrong time, but he knew I loved him deeply. After his ministry began, Herod killed Jesus' friend, John the Baptist. It was an awful day for all of us but Jesus took it especially hard. We retrieved his body and laid it in a tomb. Then we took the boat across the Sea of Galilee to mourn and to have some time away from the crowds. When we got to the other side, people from surrounding towns were there to greet us. We were ready to disperse the crowd, but Jesus had compassion on them and began to teach. That was all fine until it was getting very late and we were in a remote place with no food or shelter. It was the Passover and he told us to give them some food. Philip told him we would need eight months of wages to feed these people. Andrew said a boy had five loaves of bread and two fish. But what would that do for over 5,000 people? But the Lord told everyone to sit down, took the five loaves of bread and the two fish, said a blessing, and in a spectacular miracle, he fed the crowd. There was so much food, we had 12 baskets of leftovers. Then he dispersed the crowd and slipped away to go to pray to the Father, something he did often. 
My other friends and I got in the boat to go home to Capernaus. A storm came over the sea, and we were a long way from the shore, battling the wind. We looked out and saw a shadow on top of the water. Some of my friends thought it was a ghost and were terrified. But the Lord heard us and said, Take heart, it is I. And again, do not be afraid. Of course, I wasn't sure it was him. So I said, If it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. And I jumped out of the boat on the water. I began to walk towards him on the water. But then the wind picked up, and my human emotion of fear took over. I looked down at the water, and I began to sink. And I screamed, Lord, save me. He immediately took out, took out his hand, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? As soon as we got into the boat, the wind died down. We all knew he was the Son of God, but I was troubled because I really thought I had enough faith. And I knew his power for my years of travel with him, but my human nature prevailed, and I was afraid. The next memory was when we had just finished the Passover meal, and he told me for the third time about his suffering that was going to happen to him. He knew I loved him, and I would never let it happen to him. I promised I would lay down my life for him. He said, you would lay down your life for me? Really? Before the rooster, cr the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. I was emphatic and said, even if all the others fail away, if, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And I really believed it. We went with Jesus into the Garden of Gethsemane. Judah and the Roman soldiers approached Jesus. We fought back. I drew my sword and cut off the soldier's ear. I told Jesus I would protect him. But Jesus ordered us to stop, and he healed the soldier's ear. The Roman soldiers took Jesus away. I followed behind in the courtyard to see where they would take him. The servant girl recognized me and said, this man was with him. But I said to the woman, I am not. Later again, I was asked, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? And again, I replied, man, I am not. Finally, the third bystander noted that I had to be a follower because I was a Galilean. Adamantly, I said, I do not know what you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed, and the Lord looked at me, and his words rushed back to me. My fear of being captured caused me to deny knowing my Lord three times. All I could do was weep, to realize my human weakness despite all my blustering words to protect my Lord at any cost. The next day changed my life. The Roman soldier crucified my friend and Lord. I wasn't there, but I was in hiding, thinking they would kill all of us. John was with Mary and told us the last words and how the earth shook at his last breath. The following two days of Passover were dark, filled with sadness, anguish, hopelessness that I could not even imagine. I knew I had met the Son of God. When Jesus asked us what people of the world called him, I told him that he was the Son of God. But after his death, I was afraid. My world was in shambles. I thought I had lost my friend and Lord and did not believe he could raise from the dead. On the third day, the women went to the tomb to attend Jesus' body. They came running back. They said they had seen the risen Jesus and he would soon come to us. Of course, I didn't believe it. So I ran to the tomb. Jesus' body was not in the tomb. Instead, the clothes that had wrapped Jesus' body were folded and stacked. We were to go to Galilee and he would come to us. I was thrilled but ridden with guilt because, again, I had been afraid and I did not believe the words that my Lord had told me. He came to us while we were locked in the room that night. He showed us his risen body and his hands and his feet. We saw him again eight days later when doubting Thomas was able to touch his wounds so he could believe. The last time we were fishing, we saw a man on the beach and we didn't know who it was. He asked for some of our fish, but we had caught no fish, a common occurrence in my life. He told us to put our nets on the right side and you'd find some. Then it net immediately was filled with fish so we couldn't haul it in. I realized it was the Lord, and I threw myself into the sea. I, brought, I had brought some fish for breakfast, and Jesus requested. This was the third time I had seen the risen Lord. After breakfast, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? I said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He asked me again, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And then a third time. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? By the third time, I was exacerbated. Lord, you know I love you. Finally, he told me to follow him, feed and tend his sheep, the people of this world. He then ascended and left us. As I reflect on my last encounter with the risen Lord, by making me tell him three times I loved him, it showed his forgiveness in my denying that I knew him three times the night of his arrest. With Jesus' resurrection, I believed all he had taught us. And I was no longer afraid or doubted that he was the Son of God. 
So I spent my life spreading all of his teachings and preaching the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins and yet overcame death and is with the Father in heaven. His love is never ending, and I am privileged to call him my friend and Lord. We now rejoin our pilgrimage at the third station. third station, Jesus falls for the first time. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and was born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Many among us are caregivers and we may spend much of our lives serving others. Being a servant day in and day out is not considered glamorous or even noteworthy. It can be draining just putting one foot in front of the other, falling and struggling to get back on our feet. Mm -hmm. Our cross is so heavy, the demands of others so pressing. In humbly emptying ourselves as servants, however, we create space in our heart so that God's grace can be poured in, giving us strength to serve another day. Let us pray. Jesus, when serving feels burdensome, help us recall how God blessed you for bearing your cross with humility and with a servant heart. We lift up all who are caregivers. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. Jesus meets his mother. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. To what can I liken you? To what can I compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What likeness can I use to comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For vast as the sea is your ruin, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. A sword will pierce your own soul also, and fill your heart with bitter pain. We are called to be mothers and fathers in this world. What are we called to birth into bro a broken world filled with mourning and overwhelming need? God promises comfort and light. We are called to deliver it. Let us pray. Jesus, Jesus into this hurting world, 
Help us to bring forth the fruits of your Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We lift up all the mothers and fathers of the world. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. We now pause in our pilgrimage for our second meditation, Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene. So who was this man? He's only mentioned this one time in the entire Bible. But obviously it was important since they were, he was actually named. And he seems to have been known by some of the other followers of Jesus. So he was known to that community. In Matthew, we just hear, along the way, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon and made him carry the cross. In Luke, we get a bit more. As they, lay, as they led him off, they made, they, they made Simon, a man from Cyrene, who happened to be coming in from the countryside, carry the cross behind Jesus. From Mark's Gospel, we get the most detail. Then the soldiers led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his, the cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they took Jesus to a place called Golgotha. So, but what does this cross represent in the people of that time? Well, it wasn't a pretty piece of jewelry. It wasn't a creation in polished brass or even silver or gold. It wasn't something that was placed up on the wall or held aloft to lead a procession. The cross was the most tortuous painful, demeaning, humiliating form of death. To carry your own cross was worse than digging your own grave. Part of the torture was the ridicule of the people as they passed by carrying your own device of torture and death. Uh, Earlier, Jesus had instructed his followers to take up your cross daily and follow me. Later, Paul proclaimed to the church in Corinth, I die daily. So it's this daily commitment to forgo your personal desires and wants to commit all of your energy to following Jesus. Even the little things that we do throughout the day, all should be dedicated to him. In another interpretation, we hear Simon was led on his way home from work so now we know that here's Simon. He's tired after a day in front of a classroom or caring for patients or taking care of shop uh, customers, maybe answering questions of his clients. He just wanted to get home, mm -hmm. kick off his sandals, relax for a few minutes before helping to get dinner on the table for the family. 
But first, he needed to stop at Walgreens to pick up a prescription. He needed to run into Publix to pick up some matzah and a vegetable for dinner. There was lots of traffic in this season. And then suddenly, there's a car accident in front of it. People need help. Do I need to dial 911? What do I need to do? Or I've just gotten a phone call from a relative who got a diagnosis. I got a text from a friend who was suddenly facing some personal tragedy. Or maybe it's Jesus passing by. I die daily. We resume our pilgrimage at the fifth station. Adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. As they led Jesus away, they came upon a man of Sinai, son of Bani, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it in from Jesus. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Giving him can seem much easier than receiving him. There may be many reasons for this. You do not want to burden others. You do not want to appear weak. We are convinced we can handle it best on our own. Jesus accepted Simon's help, allowing Simon to offer the best of himself to God. Perhaps in receiving help, we too are called to invite others into life giving service. Let us pray. Jesus, allow another to share your burdens. Give us open hearts to receive gratefully, humbly, the help we are offered on the journey. We lift up all who find it hard to receive help. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one, have mercy upon us. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because you're by your holy church you have redeemed the world. We have seen him without beauty or majesty, with no looks to attract our eyes. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him. His appearance was so marked beyond human resemblance and his form beyond that of the children of men. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. 
Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. So much in our world seems to focus on outer appearances. Veronica does not have a lack of blood or sweat. The whole horrifying mess of Jesus' appearance, or his situation, keep us from extending a sense of kindness. He might be. How might a small, tender touch or a simple kind of word lift an overflow? In doing so, we can say to someone, no matter what kind of a mess you're in, God's beauty within you will never be marred. This is what I see when I look at you, and it is healing to me. Let us pray. Jesus, help us to look beyond appearances or first impressions and come to see others as you see them. We lift up all who find it hard to see beauty in themselves or in others. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. We pause in our pilgrimage for our third reflection, Veronica. I have always found the Stations of the Cross to be somewhat cinematic. As we proceed through them, I picture in my mind's eye this, the scene before me, and perhaps none more so than the Sixth Station and Veronica. Imagine the scene, if you would, the press of the crowd. I imagine it's really loud, the shouting of the masses of people, the sun bearing down, the incredible heat, the smell of sweat, the fear of being pushed and jostled. And then, through a gap in the crowd, Veronica sees Jesus, a man suffering, blood, sweat, tears upon his face, locked in a struggle. It would be easier for her to avert her eyes to quietly wipe her tears, remaining another faceless individual in the crowd, to accept her role as bystander, to silently watch Christ's crucifixion from a distance. But Veronica does not do this. Veronica makes a choice, and it is not the safe choice. She does not hesitate, she is not afraid, or if she is, she overcomes it. She risks persecution, risks possible punishment, and she willingly thrusts herself forward from the crowd towards Jesus in an act of charity, in an act of compassion. She removes her own veil, an act both intimate and vulnerable, and she uses it to wipe the face of Jesus in his moment of suffering and distress. It is an act that is profoundly human and yet profoundly good. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And we're told at this point a miracle occurs imprinting the face of Jesus upon the cloth. I like to think that there's a larger miracle that occurs at the same time, and that is the impression of Jesus upon Veronica's heart. A larger miracle that follows us to this day when we allow the true image of Jesus to be impressed upon our hearts. In the face of Jesus, bloodied and bruised, Veronica saw the face of God and his goodness. Only with our heart can we see Jesus. Only love enables us to recognize the God who is love itself. 
In our own lives, it is easy, too easy, to be wrapped up in the big picture with the overwhelming issues that affect us locally, nationally, globally, to be overwhelmed by it all. I'm often pulled in two directions. I, I want to be informed and watch the news, but I also don't want to sink into despair and the hopelessness that sometimes that can bring. And while we must overcome our fears and take action on the major issues that we face as a human family, we must find courage and fight that fight with honor. But we also have the ability to show compassion and love to every person we come into contact with through small acts of kindness rather than going through the motions and being consumed by our personal lives. It is in this that we become closer to God. It is in this that we can feel the face of God impressed upon our hearts. Take time to show our neighbors that we love and appreciate them. And I pray that through compassion, through small acts of kindness, undertaken by all of us, we can all find the face of God impressed upon our own hearts. We'll complete the second hour by reading the seventh station, which we uh, omitted uh, there for a moment. I hold uh, called us to meditation too soon. Uh, so we'll do the seventh station, then we'll sing uh, verses five through seven of hymn 458. Um, so let's move to the seventh station. The seventh station, Jesus calls for the second time. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Surely he was, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. For the transgression of my people was his stricken. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. There are many ways to stray, to wander away from God. Perhaps we would like to think that our stray is our own business and has nothing to do with others. Have we ever considered that in straying we may oppress or afflict us? If we wander away from God's love, we are more prone to temptation. If, like Christ, we remain faithful, we are strengthened to help others with their burdens, not add to them. Let us pray. Jesus, Jesus help us to lift burdens through our faithfulness, not create them through our sickness or by succumbing to temptations. We lift up all who have wandered away from you. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. I now invite us to sing verses 5 through 7 of hymn 458. Following the singing of the hymn, there'll be an opportunity for venerations of the cross before we begin our third hour.
we begin our third and final hour at the eighth station. Let us sing first, What Wondrous Love Is This? Now let us move to the eighth station. Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. There followed after Jesus a great multitude of the people, and among them were women who bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. It takes such energy to care deeply, especially when we are in the midst of our own troubles. Even in the midst of an unimaginable pain and weariness, however, Jesus does not turn away from the pain of others, but deliberately turns toward it. When we prevent ourselves from seeing the suffering of others, we increase our own. Caring is not a matter of comfort or convenience, but an act of compassion. Let us pray. Jesus, Jesus you, you saw the tears, tears of others and, and had compassion on them. Help us to choose compassion even in the midst of our own distress. We lift up all who weep this day. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us.
Jesus fall a third time. We adore, we adore you, O Christ, Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. He has besieged me and enveloped me in bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. Remember, O oh Lord, my affliction and bitterness, the wormwood and the gall. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shears is mute, so he opened not his mouth. Falling takes its toll, but offers its blessings as well. In falling, we are reminded of the frailty of our bodies, and we can see the world from the vantage point of those humble and on the ground. Even if our bodies start to weaken after many falls, our spirits can grow stronger as we increasingly rely on God's grace to help us to rise again. Let us pray. Jesus, Jesus you, you fell but rose again for our sake. Help us not to fall into bitterness because of our afflictions, but to fall ever more deeply into trusting you. We lift up all who struggle with bitterness. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. When they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mingled with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And they divided his garments among them by casting lots. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. They gave me gall to eat, and when I was thirsty, they gave me vinegar to drink. The soldiers stripped away nothing from Jesus that truly mattered. They only uncloaked their own greed and lack of mercy. Whatever earthly possessions are taken from us, by worldly hands, we are eternally clothed in glory by God, and our souls are eternally laid bare before God. Let us pray. Jesus, all, all that you had was, was given to God, you, not taken you. from you. Strip us of all that would stand in the way of receiving your grace and mercy. We lift up all those from whom everything has been taken. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mighty one, have mercy upon us. We now pause in our pilgrimage for a reflection on Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is a prominent figure in the Gospels and was mentioned 12 times. Mary came from a small village called Magdala on the north side of Galilee, and most likely where Jesus and her met. Seven demons possessed Mary, and she would be considered emotionally and physiologically battered and bruised in modern times. However, when Jesus met Mary, he could see through the years of pain and commanded the de demons to leave her. Her beauty was restored, which was always known to the Lord. It is a gentle reminder that we need to always look beyond the physical appearances and see the heart of those around us. Once Jesus freed Mary in gratitude of her healing, 
She dedicated her life, giving all she had to build and support Jesus' ministry. Mary's personal teaching with the Lord showed that he included women in discipleship to spread the great news of the kingdom of God. Imagine Mary following Jesus through his teachings. She was there during the feeding of the 5,000, the transfiguration, the parables, the Sermon on the Mount. Just being in his presence daily must have been truly holy. In Jesus' time, women were not accepted as equals. So Peter objected that Mary traveled with the, the disciples. Simon Peter complained to Jesus, let Mary go forth from among us, for women are not worthy of this, of this life. But Jesus responded, behold, I shall lead her. I may make her male in order that she may become a living spirit like you males. For every woman who makes herself male shall enter the kingdom of heaven. This shows that the Lord genuinely intended for women of his time to spread the great news of the kingdom of God. But you know, Mary never abandoned Jesus. Following at a distance, as Jesus was carrying the cross through the streets of Jerusalem, can you even fathom the devastation and helplessness Mary was feeling at the foot of the cross? Watching her Lord suffer, taking his last breath, she was filled with total despair. Then, as it was in the tradition in those days, they would anoint the body. But no, Mary had to wait because it was the Sabbath. The following day, Mary went to the tomb to anoint the body. When she arrived, the stone had been removed and the body was gone. Mary cried and asked the angels, where have you taken my Lord? Then Jesus appeared and called her by name. In all four gospels, Mary is at the crucifixion and the resurrection. Most importantly, this once broken woman was transformed by Jesus and was the chosen one to see the risen Lord first. Mary is the disciple that arguably started Christianity. Many scholars refer Mary as the apostle to the apostles. Early in the Christmas, early in the Christianity shows that Mary, like the disciples, spread the news of the risen one through the region and through the ancient world. Although some stories say she was placed on a boat and set to sea, banished from her land, and she ended up in France, no matter what the truth was, what happened to Mary, we know that she was a broken woman when Jesus healed to become the person that God created her to be, to bring Christianity to the world's women. On this Good Friday, if you have brokenness in your life, let Mary be the example of a healing power of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. We resume our pilgrimage at the 11th station. The 11th station, Jesus is nailed. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by our holy cross you have redeemed the world. When it comes to the place which was called the skull, there they crucify him, and with him they crucify two criminals, one on the right and one on the left, and Jesus between them. And the scriptures were fulfilled, which says, he was numbered with the transgressors. They pierced his hand, and my feet, they stare and gloat over me. It seems that Jesus is always in the company of transgressors, in the middle of the messy lives in a broken world. Here, here is this Christ, the one who was, is, and will always be in an absolute center, the holy of holiness from which all comes into being and to which all will turn. Let us pray. Jesus, you stretch out your arms to bridge the chasms between us. Help us to move into the very center, your saving embrace. All who need to forgive someone. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us.
12th station, Jesus dies on the cross. We adore you, o Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And when Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And then, crying aloud, he said, Father, in your hands I commend my spirit. And he bowed his head and handed over the spirit. Christ for us became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. In the midst of unspeakable agony or unfathomable compassion, from the cross, Jesus speaks words of love to his mother, to his disciples, and to each of us. In calling us to behold one another, he says to us, I love you. You are precious to me. I give the gift of one another. Through my love, you will see each other in new and sacred ways. You will stretch out your arms and embrace and heal one another. Let us pray. Jesus, Jesus help us to hand over our spirit to you that so that we may be strengthened to love one another as you love us. We lift up all who care for the dying. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. We now pause for a reflection on John. My name is John. I'm old now. All the other followers of Jesus have died. I live in Ephesus by the Mediterranean Sea, looking across the turquoise waters. I can see the Isle of Patmos, where for many years I was exiled. I and my followers have written my gospel. I have written letters to the churches that I helped form. But now in my old age, I find myself remembering myself as a young man. I grew up by the Sea of Galilee that pearl of a lake. My dad was a fisherman, Zebedee. My brother James and I used to love and get in the boats as little children and help him get the nets ready. We loved to count the fish at the end of the day. We dreamed of being fishermen ourselves. We grew up in Capernaum. Simon, whom Jesus later called Peter, and his brother Andrew were our best friends. When we became young men, we actually started fishing together, following in our father's footsteps. And then Jesus came. Peter was always outspoken and blunt, always spoke what was on his mind even before he thought about it. I was more of a, a dreamer. My favorite times were the early mornings before the world awoke when I'd watch the sun rise over the lake and in the stillness and in the quiet of those mornings I found God, and God found me. And then I met Jesus, 
And in meeting him, it was like meeting the sunrise. There was in him a power, a love, a light that drew me and I wanted to be near him and to never leave. When he told us to cast down our nets and to follow him, I was right behind him. I knew this was my life and my life would be forever changed because of him. I remember the night after he fed the 5,000. We were in the boats crossing the Sea of Galilee, and he came to us across the sea, a light in the darkness, a light that pierced the darkness, and the darkness didn't overcome it. And he said, do not be afraid. It is I. And I knew I had met God. And God had met me. I remember when he called us together for the Last Supper in the intensity and intimacy of that night. I remember when he washed our feet and I felt my soul being washed. And when we ate with him, I lay on the couch beside him and my ear drew close and I heard his heartbeat, the heartbeat of God. And I felt a oneness. I felt the sun, the sunrise, the sunset, the light of God, the waters of the Sea of Galilee, all that was right and good and true was part of me, and I was part of him. And I wanted to abide in that love. He told us that night, love one another as I have loved you, you are to love one another. Abide in my love. And I did. And I do. I remember that Good Friday that horrible Friday when he hung on the cross. His mother Mary was beside me. I loved him. I still do and always will. And I know I was loved for God is love. And he looked at me as only Jesus could look. A look that went into the depths of my very being. And he said, here is your mother. And then he looked at Mary, his mother. 
She could barely lift her head because of her weight of grief and her tears. And he said, here is your son. I placed my arm gently around Mary and I drew her close to me. And truly she became my mother, a second mother. Mary came and lived with me for many years after this in Ephesus. She's long gone now to be with her son. I loved Mary. I still do. And now as an old man, as I look at the sun glinting off the turquoise sea outside of Ephesus, I feel a oneness with God, a oneness with Jesus. I pray all the world would know this oneness. I pray all the world would love one another just as he loves us. For God is love. That's what I wrote in one of my letters. It's what I believed. It's what I still do believe. Abide in his love. Pilgrimage continues at the 13th station. The 13th station, Jesus is taken down from the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. All you who pass by and behold and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, my eyes are spent with weeping. My soul is in tumult. My heart is poured out in grief because of the downfall of my people. Do not call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Her tears run down her cheeks, and she has none comfort her. The sword that Simeon predicted would pierce her soul is plunging deep into Mary's heart. Jesus' agony is over, but hers is just beginning. She sees a lifetime of sorrow stretching out in front of her. She must wonder if she will always be marred now and never 
Naomi again. Why has the Almighty allowed this to happen? In the midst of loss, we wonder the same things. Let us pray. Jesus, Thus, you held your mother as she wept over you. Be present with us in the midst of our grief. We lift up all who have lost a child. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one, have mercy upon us. The 14th station. Jesus is laid in the tomb. We adore you. You, O Christ, and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered, ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb. You will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see corruption. Tragic circumstances often give us rise to deep compassion and tenderness. When grief threatens to overwhelm and our souls are in tumult, we, like Joseph of Arimathea, can find comfort in offering what we have, trusting that God will bless it. Whatever our offering, when it comes from the heart, it is enough. Let us pray. Jesus, Jesus your servant, servant Joseph, Joseph, offered what he could. Help, help us to do what we can, can the smallest of things, with the greatest of love. We lift up all who are struggling with grief. Holy God, holy, holy and mighty, holy, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. We are now seated for our final reflection on Mary. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith to the disciple, Behold thy mother. John 19, 25 to 27. No, Mary, like Jesus, was not at all unacquainted with grief and sorrow. At the very beginning, we are told in Luke chapter 1, 28 to 29. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee, blessed art thou 
among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. But this was but the forerunner of Mary's many, many troubles. You see, Gabriel had come to announce to her the fact of the miraculous conception. And a moment's reflection will show us that it was no light matter for Mary to become the mother of her Lord and Savior in this very mysterious and unheard of way. You see, it brought with it, brought with it in no doubt, at a distant date, maybe great honor or even fame, but it brought with it at the present time no small danger to Mary's reputation and no small trial to her faith. But isn't it beautiful to observe her quiet submission to God's will? And as we are told in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, And Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Yes, this was Mary's response to God's will. This was lovely resignation. Nevertheless, Mary was indeed troubled at the Annunciation. And as we have said before, this was just a precursor to her many, many sorrows. What sorrow it must have caused her, because there was no room in the inn to lay her newborn baby. She had to lay him on the hay, surrounded by the animals where the animals were fed in that manger. What anguish must have been hers when she learned of Herod's plot to destroy her infant's life? What trouble was given her when she was forced on his account to flee into a foreign country and to sojourn there for many, many years in the land of Egypt? What piercing of soul must have been hers when she saw her son despised and rejected by men. What grief must have pierced her heart as she beheld him hated and persecuted by his very, very own nation. And who can imagine what she passed through as she stood there by the cross? My brothers and sisters in Christ, If Christ was a man of sorrow, Mary was a woman of sorrow. Now, during Jesus' infancy, his childhood, and most probably throughout most of his public life, his public ministry, we hear and we see so very little of Mary. Her life was lived in the background among the shadows. But now, when the supreme hour strikes of her son's agony, when the world has cast out the child of her womb, she stands there by the cross. Who can fitly portray such a picture? Here, we see on full display a mother's heart. She's the dying man's mother, the one who agonizes there on the cross is her child. She it was who planted those first kisses on that brow now crowned with thorns. She it was who guided those little hands and feet though, during their first infantile moments. No mother ever suffered as she did. His disciples desert him. His friends may forsake him. His nation may despise him. But his mother stands there at the foot of the cross. Who 
can fathom or analyze a mother's heart? Who can measure those hours of sorrow and suffering as the sword was slowly drawn through Mary's soul? And my brothers and sisters, hers was no hysterical or demonstrative sorrow. There was no show of feminine weakness. No wild old cry of uncontrollable anguish, no fainting, none of that. Not a word that fell from her lips has been recorded in any of the four Gospels, and you can check that out. Apparently, she suffered. She suffered in unbroken silence. Yet her sorrow was nonetheless real. It was acute. They say still waters run deep, and that is true. She saw that brow pierced with cruel thorns, but she could not smooth or touch them tenderly. She watched his pierced hands and feet grow numb and livid, but she might not soothe them. She marks his need for a drink, but she could not quench his thirst. She suffered in profound desolation of spirit. There stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. The crowds are mocking, the thieves are taunting, the priests, the priests are jeering. The soldiers are callous and indifferent. The Savior, he's bleeding, he's dying. And there his mother, beholding this horrible, horrible mockery. One wonder if she had fainted at such a sight. What wonder if she had turned away from such a spectacle. What wonder if she had fled from such a scene, but no, no, she does not. She does not crouch or run away. She does not faint. She does not even sink to the ground in grief. She stands there. Her action and her attitude are unique, very in unique indeed. In all the annals of the history of our race, there is no parallel, none whatsoever. What transcendent courage, I may say. She stood by the cross of Jesus. What marvelous fortitude. She represses her grief. And she stands there in silence. And was it not reverence for the Lord that prevented her from disturbing his final moments? When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, Behold thy son, and saith to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. And from what we learn from the gospel, that disciple was John. And from what Father Andrew just remind me, John took Mary to his own home. I thank you. I invite us now to sing, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? Hymn 172. And following the singing of the hymn, there'll be an opportunity for venerating the cross during the musical meditation. And then at the end, if you join me around the altar, 
uh, will kneel and pray during the tolling of the bells. Hymn 172. <laughs> 